But we are in Genesis chapter 13. And Genesis chapter 13 begins where we, we pick up where Abraham and Lot, or Abram, his, his name gets changed to Abraham, so you might hear me interchange that. So it's just, just know it's the same person. Abram and Lot, they separate. That's in chapter 13. In chapter 14, we see that Lot gets in a little trouble and Abram has to go rescue Lot. And as I was thinking about where, what we've been talking about up to this point, I started thinking about warning labels on uh, products. I don't know if you've ever looked at products and saw warning labels. And there's some very strange warning labels out there. Some, some that I think are, are strange and some are funny. For example, on a chainsaw, there was a warning label that read, do not operate chainsaw while upset. Now, I was thinking about that. It's just like, they must have seen the movie Chainsaw Massacre or something and been like, yeah, we better put this warning on this on here because if people get upset, they might do some crazy things. I, I don't know. But I saw another one is a hot sauce in Belize, and, and a hot sauce was called Marie Sharp's Hot Sauce. And this is what the warning label says. It says, warning, must be strong to handle this sauce. Keep out of reach of children. And then, then it says this, do not play tricks on weak or elderly with this sauce. I'm just like... Man, there's somebody out there who probably played a trick on their grandma, especially today. Don't do that to your moms or grandmas today because it's Mother's Day. Just don't do that. It's, it's not a good idea. It's a little cruel. And there's one more that, that I read that's a mattress company. A mattress company put a warning label on their mattress that says, do not attempt to swallow. And I'm like, how in the world do you swallow a mattress? And I was thinking, this, this warning had to have been for like a whale or something because only a well can swallow a whole, I don't know. So there's just some strange warning labels out there. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking of Abram. And if Abram was going to give us a, a warning label, I think he would have given us a warning label as we happen to fall upon uh, the past weeks, in chapter 12 especially, when he runs down to Egypt. And I think his warning label would say this, doubt can be hazardous to your and everyone else's health. As a matter of fact, maybe Abram should have had a warning label on himself that says, disobedient patriarch, stay away. Because last week, we see that he failed. But in all fairness, he was just learning to walk by faith. You know, we read in the New Testament that Abram was the, the father of faith. And what we talked about last week, and I think it's important for, for me to repeat this week, is that Abram's faith didn't start up here. His faith started down here, and God had to build his faith. And it's just like us, that Abram, his faith starts down here, and our faith starts down here, and God builds our faith. See, last week we talked about where he came from. He came from this place called Ur, the Chaldeans, and it was a place of idol worship. So he was getting his faith sea legs, if you will, on the ship of faith. He was what, what I would call a baby believer, and just learning how to walk and trust the Lord. So in chapter 12, this, at least the second part of it, it also represents a, a doubt where he leaves the land that God called him to and he goes down to Egypt because of a famine. This is what we talked about last week. But remember, he's called the father of them who believe in the New Testament. But as I mentioned last week, he had a, a lapse in his belief. As a matter of fact, he might have also been called in last, last week the father of them who be lying. Because remember, if you were here last week, he lied to uh, the Egyptians about his wife. He said, tell them that you are my sister so that they won't kill me. And that's what they do. But he lied. Yet in the New Testament, again, they call him the father of those who believe. And I think you and I, like I said, are, are walking around the same path of faith, of growing in our faith. But we do have faith. We do trust God. and We do believe in him. But we also fail, we also falter, we also stumble on our walk. So our faith is like this. We see in Abram's life that he he's fails and then he, he has faith. And then he fails and has faith. It's just like this. And it's just like us. Our faith is like this as well. So now we're in, in chapter 13 and we see that Abram goes back. Uh, he would return to the land of promise and I would think if we were to learn a lesson, and what Abraham, would, I think, would agree with, is that uh, it's better to trust God in your life with, when the cupboard is bare, when everything is not going well, and not just the times where everything is going well, when, when, you have the, when you're in the land of plenty like Egypt would have been. 
So let's dive in. This is Genesis 13, 1 through 4. It says, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him, to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent has been at the beginning between Bethel and, and I. And remember, that's what we talked about where he was at the beginning of chapter 12. To the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So I want us to notice the, the, this one word in here or these couple of words in here. The Abram, it says, went up. Abram went up. Now, before it said that he went down. He went down to Egypt. And it's true geograph uh, ge geographically and relationally and spiritually that he went down when he went down to Egypt. Because at any moment that we are away from God's will, then we are, are going a step down in our, in our lives. You know, another example of this is Jonah. Uh, you may be familiar with Jonah in the Bible. Uh, God told him to go to Nineveh. And what did he do? He went down to Joppa. And then he went down into the ship. Then he went down into the sea and down into the fish's belly. And it only it was when he was in the belly and he decided, you know what, God? I'm going to obey you. I'll go to Nineveh that the fish spit him up. He went up. So he went down, down, down until he decided to be obedient. And then he went back up. And Abram, it's kind of the same thing. He comes back and he goes up. And it says in verse 1, he was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. Now this is interesting because it's the first time the Bible actually mentions riches in the Bible. And it's referring to Abram, the first patriarch. And so it kind of, as we look at the Bible, it gives us a picture of, of money. Money isn't a bad thing and it isn't a good thing. It's a neutral thing. And money, it really depends on how it affects you and what you do with it and how, how you react to it. That's what is important. Now, someone might say, well, Aaron, doesn't the Bible say that, that the money is the root of all evil? And I'll say that, that no, it doesn't. That's actually a misconception. I, it, the reference that we're referring to is in 1 Timothy 6. And it says the love of money is a root. That is one of many roots of all kinds of evil. So that kind of sheds a, a, a new light on uh, money in this picture. Because you can be without money and you can still have the love of money and fall into trouble. You can try to steal it or try to get it. You try to possess money. Or you can have a lot of money by the grace of God and God blesses you with it and it doesn't affect you as much as somebody who, who, uh, who they might, if they had it, it would destroy them. So sometimes it's, it's God who blesses with things and money and, and it's a result of the blessings from God. An example of this in the Bible is, is Joseph. Uh, you know, his, his story begins difficult, right? He, he gets sold into slavery. But he eventually becomes the second in command of the whole world, if you will, and the prime minister of Egypt. And he becomes very wealthy. So sometimes it's because of God's blessings. But other people are rich not because of God's blessings, but because they steal, they cheat, or they work really hard for their money, and it becomes a, an idol to them, and they begin to serve serving money. Now, I had a, I had a pastor... Uh, that I listen to a lot in the States. And, and he says that, that money, we are not to serve money. Money serves us as we serve the Lord. And I, I love that notion of when it comes to money because that's exactly how we should view it. That yes, when we get money, we're going to use it, but we're going to use it for his glory. But now we see that Abram was very rich. And the Bible makes it clear, at least in part, that it was because of the blessings of God. But having said that, Riches actually become a problem. Because though Abram's rich, we also see that his nephew, Lot, who's with him, also is rich. And it becomes an issue as we continue through the book of Genesis. The things that they have will be the center of conflict. And we'll get to that. But in verse 3, it says, He went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel. Now Bethel, by the way, means the house of God. And it's actually uh, Jacob who calls it that, but it's referred to here So, because people that are going to read the book of Genesis would know that name. So it it's, it's means the house of God. And it says, he, to the, it says here that it's to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, 
to the place where the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called the name of the Lord. So he, let me just paint this picture. So Bethel means house of God, and the word I, it mean, it, that little town that he was between, it means heap or dump. So it's interesting that, that we have this imagery here where he's, we have Abraham pitching his tent in between the house of God and the dump. He's coming out of Egypt, from Egypt. He's pinched his tent, and he's going toward the house of God, toward, toward Bethel. And there's where his altar is. That's where he's going to worship. And that's where he was at the beginning of chapter 12 when he first came out in, uh, to the place where the Lord called him. And that is the same position that you and I are in, right? We have been saved from this world, and we're on our way toward heaven. And that's our real home, right? The house of God. We talked about that last week, that this earth isn't our home. Our home is a heavenly city that is being prepared, is prepared for us. And that's where God dwells. And we're sort of in this in-between position, between the dump of this world and between the house of God that we're moving toward as we live our life here on earth. But in verse 4, he gets to Bethel. And at Bethel was an altar that he saw at the beginning of chapter 12, like I've mentioned. And, the, and there, and that's where he was at first, and Abram called on the Lord once again. And it's interesting that last week when we saw that he was in Egypt, we don't see Abram calling on the name of the Lord at all. We don't see any mention of that in Scripture. He just went there to escape the famine. But here he goes back to the altar. So he remembers where he come, came from. He remembers the altar that he was enjoying with the Lord and that relationship that he had in, in chapter 12. He remembers that. And he repents from the unbelief that caused him to go down to Egypt. And he repeats what he did at the beginning. He goes back to the altar and worships there once again at that altar. And maybe that sounds familiar. In the book of Revelation, the very last book, Jesus is talking to the church of Ephesus. And he says, remember where you have fallen. Repent and do your first works again. So what he's essentially saying is remember, repent, and repeat. That's, and that's exactly what Abram does. He remembers the fellowship that he had with God. And while he was trusting God in, in the beginning of chapter 12 when he first made that altar. And he remembers that. And it was a much better place than when he was in Egypt where all that trouble was. And he repented from the unbelief. And he goes back and goes again and does what he did at the beginning. And let me tell you, that, that is just speaks to me and it speaks to my heart. And I hope that speaks to you. Because maybe lately you've experienced a distance, a separation from God, where you don't feel a closeness to God like you used to feel. Maybe you had this closeness where you, maybe you got up in the morning or you had some time during the day where you spent time with the Lord and your relationship was great and you prayed and you spent time and, and you were, he was speaking to you through his word. But then lately you're not experiencing that closeness anymore. I don't know if anyone's experiencing that. But if you are, it could be that the Lord is calling you back to Bethel. He's calling you back to the altar to repent from whatever brought you away from that and caused that distance in your life. So here's my encouragement. If you stumble, like we see Abram, the father of faith, if we see him, if you're stumbling like Abram, then there's an altar that's awaiting for you to come back to. Or maybe there's even, I feel like there's people that, that have seen the errors of their way and they've repented, they've repented and asked for forgiveness. And we know that, that the Bible tells us when we ask for forgiveness that he, in fact, he, he does it right then, instantly forgives us. But there's still guilt and shame in our lives and we don't want to be around believers or we don't want to come back to church because of that guilt and shame. But remember the Bible tells us that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you, if, if you repented and, and asked for forgiveness from the Lord, that guilt and shame that you're still feeling, that's not from the Lord. That is from you, yourself, listening to the enemy's lies. Because there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you, just like Caitlin mentioned before, that we are to do life together. That's why we have life groups. That's why we have to get together as a community of believers. And let me tell you, one of the most healing things in my life was when I allowed other people into the mess in my life. And let me tell you, it was very hard. Yes, it was, it was a difficult thing to do, but it was healing. 
And that's what exactly what James 5.16 tells us. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So my encouragement to us this morning is to remember, to repent, and to repeat. Go back to those first works that you did that, that was drawing you close to the Lord. Because the Bible tells us that if you draw close to the Lord, then he will draw close to you. So let's keep going, verses 5 and 7. It says, Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks, herds, and tents. So Abram was also rich. He also had things. And now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. So there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So though there's nothing inherently wrong with wealth, there, we see here that the, it does bring about a source of conflict in Abram and Lot, this nephew of, of Abram. And there's something else that we notice that in this last verse, that they're not alone. Not only does the land have to support them, but it also has to support these Canaanites and these Perizzites. So that the land has to support, there's four groups of people here. And I think something else that, that's important that the, the, to mention here, and I, I touched on this a little bit last week, is here there's a conflict between a group of God's people and another group of God's people, Abram and Lot. And what we see is the world is watching. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were watching Abram and Lot very, very carefully. They're hearing the bickering. They're seeing all this stuff that's going on between the herdsmen of the two groups. And let me tell you, when the dirty laundry of the church uh, is aired out in front of the world, the church has issues, that has problems. It's a real mess. It's dangerous. It can be wrong. We're always to have to, have to be careful because of who's watching and, and who's listening. And we'll see at the end of chapter 14, Lord willing, if we get there, the contrast between the relationship between Lot and Abram here and Abram and Melchizedek at the end. But the Canaanites and the Perizzites are around and they're looking and they're listening. And I can just imagine them hearing the bickering and, and just thinking, you know what, these, these guys are just like us. You know, they, they say they worship the true God, but when they're arguing just like us, they're, they're just like us. They're no different. I can just imagine that those are the kind of things that were being said. And here's the thing. Many people will never listen to what any believer says because of what they are, because of how they live. And last week we talked about how our life is a testimony, that people will look at our life and it's going to reflect God or it's going to reflect the world. And I think with this bickering and stuff going on, it was reflecting the world in this moment. And Abraham kind of notices it as, we, as we'll see in, in the, uh, as we continue. But Abraham, he's a man with a covenant relationship with God. And simply by virtue, uh, Lot is also considered a, a man of God, as someone who is part of God's people. But as we know from the story, as we continue, that Abram, though he wasn't perfect, he was walking with God. While Lot, it doesn't seem like he was walking with God. It actually looks like that Lot was actually just walking with Abram. In verse 1, remember it said, Abram went up from Egypt, and he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot went with him. So Abram's obeying God, and Abram's walking with God, but Lot is walking with Abram. Essentially, he's, he's a tag-along. Tagging along, but with a, a different appetite, if you will. He's desiring something else. He wants something else. He really wants what the world has to offer, as we see. So these are two different men with two different appetites, with two different values, and they want different things, as we'll see as we keep going in verses 8 and 9. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there, no, let there be no strife between you and me, and between the herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. He says, if you take the left, then I'll take the right. And if you take the right, then I will take the left. So you see, Abram notices there's, there's an issue. And he's trying to be a peacemaker. And he says, this is not the whole land before you. And, you know, Abram, 
He's the eldest here. He's the one that God promised the land to. He didn't promise it to his lot, his, his, lot, his nephew. He promised to Abram. But so it was out of pure generosity where Abram's like, you know what, you pick Lot. And I think it also shows us another thing, that Abram's not yielding to Lot out of weakness, but out of love and trusting God. So we see that, that his faith is being built upon. We see that he, he's growing in his faith here. And a few acres of grazing land didn't seem worth fighting for to a man with an eternal perspective. And God was glorified in this. Just like God was glorified when Paul, out of, uh, out of love, waived his right to be supported by the gospel, as we see in 1 Corinthians. And just like God is glorified through Jesus when he, when he, out of love, waived his right through existence without human suffering and, or trial by experience. And it's out of love that he went to the cross for us. And what Abram does here is a beautiful example of what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2. He says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind let each, other, each of us esteem others better than ourselves. So right or left, Abram knows that he can trust God. Abram knew whatever Lot chose that God would be with him, be walking beside him. And that's a huge contrast to what we talked about last week. We see that his faith is here growing. It, it's, it was down here, but maybe it's here now. And we see as we continue, it just continues to kind of go up and down. So we can see his faith growing. Because in Egypt, Abram thought he had to take his own fate into his own hands. I have to go to Egypt to escape this famine. I have to lie to them to, say, to save my life. He had, took it in his own hands. And now he's looking at God to do that. He's wiser. He's looking at God for, for his uh, interest. So left or right, it doesn't matter because he knows that God is going to be there with him. So let's see what Lot chooses in verses 10 through 13. It says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, and, and listen to this, like the land of Egypt, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plains and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So Lot lifts up his eyes, and what does he see? He sees a well-watered, area that reminded him of what? It reminded him of Egypt. It reminded him of that place that, that Abram looked at and was like, oh man, I got to get out of here. I got to go back to where, where I was before with the Lord. And it reminded him of that. And it, it, exactly what it says, it, it says it was like the land of Egypt. So it's like he almost came from a spell, if you will, of being in Egypt in the Nile River Valley, and which is very similar geographically to the Jordan Plain that he looked up and what he saw. So he had left Egypt, but he hadn't left Egypt in his heart. He was looking for something that had that security blanket that he had in Egypt. He had left Egypt, but it hasn't left his heart. And it seems Abram, he left Egypt. He repented of that. He remembers that, and he goes back to the altar, and he sacrifices. But Lot simply returns back to the land. He wants something that reminds him of Egypt. So here's the problem for Abram. Abram. Abram has. You can take the boy out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the boy. He wants what he left. And essentially, like I said before, he's a tag-along believer. And I think there's a lot of people in the world that are tag-along believers. They're, they're raised in church, and they go to church because they are raised in it, and they're tagging along with their parents, and they're tagging along with their friends, they're tagging along with their spouse, whatever that may look like. But really, they love the world, and that's what they, that's what they prefer. That's why I think it's amazing when, when students uh, leave their home and they, and they decide to come to church. That's just like a, a decision that you made that, that was important to you. I think that's awesome, and that's great, and I love it. But you can't have both. James says in James chapter 4, it says, Whoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So you can't love the world and all its securities while loving God and all that he has. And what we see, it polarizes Lot and Abram. 
And so it says, Lot chose for himself all the plains of the Jordan. Not just part of it, he wanted all of it. So he chose for himself and they separated from each other. And notice this, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the city and plains and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So he, he went to Sodom and you might think, well, he didn't know that they were, they were wicked yet. But it says in the very next verse, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So we're getting this, this idea of Lot, this insight on him, that we have these, these two, and we can compare the two. Even though I said Abram wasn't perfect, he chose uh, the wise. He would be the wise man, and it would be the wise man versus the worldly man. Abram, the wise man, learned his lesson. He said, you know, Egypt, I've been there, I've done that. Where Lot, the worldly man, thinking of what is best for his family, he looks up and says, oh man, this reminds me of Egypt. I'm going to go there. Abram, on the other hand, instead of choosing for himself, is sort of just like, you know what, I trust God. Lot, you choose, and I know God's going to help me through this. And Lot lifts up his eyes and sees the plains of Jordan. He says, I want that. That's what he wants, and that's where he goes. But we see, as we continue, it's going to become an issue and when we get to uh, chapter 14 and, and beyond. So they separate from one another, and then we get to verse 14 through 17. It says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. So essentially all around him. For all the land which you see, I give you and your descendants forever. And I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could be count the number of dust on the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. And arise and walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. So God waits until Lot is separated from him, and then he repeats what he's already said to Abram in promising him this land. And because this was a promise for Abram, not Lot. And even though he was generous and gave that, the lane, the Jordan plain to Lot, God is reminding him, no, this is all yours. I'm giving it to you. And we see that he's repeating this promise that he promised him back when he was in Ur, the Chaldeans, when he was in that idol worshiping. He promised him this already. And he's just reminding him of this, encouraging him in this. And I want us to notice in this last verse, verse 17, it says, Rise, walking in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. See, as a token of Abraham's reception of the land by faith, God wants him to explore the land of promise. He wants him to walk through it like it's his, even though it's not his just yet. In the same way, God wants us to, to explore the land of promise. And it's not necessarily a plot of land that we look up and see, but the land of promise that I'm talking about is his word, God's word, where God has given us what Second Peter says, exceedingly great and precious promises, where he's given us all things that pertain to godliness. He wants us to walk through that land. He wants us to possess that land and by faith live it out in our lives and trust it and understand that what it says is true. So live by faith and live by the word of God. Then as we close chapter 13 in verse 18, it says, And Abram moved his tent and went to dwell in the terebinth tree in Mamre, which, uh, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So to recap this chapter, he separates from Lot. For Lot, we'll see it's a bad thing. For Abram, it's a good thing. And you and I in the New Testament are called to be separated from those who are not walking with the Lord. And probably one of the, the key notes, um, scriptures along the lines is 2 Corinthians 6, where Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah, and it says this, Come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord. For I will receive you and I will be, the, be a father to you and you will be my children. So it's a call of separation, to separate. And that's exactly what sanctification means. It needs to be set apart. See, we're saved by, by forgiveness. We're justified through what Jesus did on the cross. But we, we're continuing to walk in sanctification as we grow in our faith. And we're separated from the world. For you see, sometimes when we're in wrong company and they don't share the same spiritual values as we do, 
and they don't hunger after the Lord, maybe they hunger after Sodom or the plains of Jordan, then sometimes they can drag us down. And 2 Timothy 2 is a beautiful scripture. It says, flee also youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love. And, and get this, he says, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, it's hard to be around a company of people who are going to drag you down spiritually. And the Bible encourages us to get around people who are going to build us up spiritually. And that's why I'm so thankful to have this church body and our life groups because we're here to live life together, to build each other up spiritually. So as we close chapter 13, Abram's in this beautiful green spot uh, in Hamri and Hebron, and he builds a sea, he builds another altar. So we end this chapter, they separate, and then in the beginning of chapter 14, we see that Lot runs into trouble. So let's dive in, chapter 14. And it came to pass in the days of Amphrophel, king of Shinar, and Ariot, king of Elziar, and Kela Dolemir, king of Eliam, and Tidal, king of nations, and they had war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, uh, king of Enma, and Sheber, king of Zebulun, and the king of Bela, that is Zeor. All these joined together in the valley of Sidium, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedorlaomer, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> and the thirteenth year they rebelled. So chapter 14 brings us to an international crisis, a, the first war, so to speak, in the Bible as we see, as is mentioned here. And it's four kings versus five kings. And here's the deal. These 12 years, th these cities, were, uh, they were down in the plain in the Dead Sea in the Jordan Valley, and they played tribute, they paid taxes, they paid their money to this guy that's mentioned here, this Kedoleomir. In the 13th year, they were just like, you know what, we had enough. We are going to... We don't want to do this anymore. We're not going to pay you a dime anymore. And they rebelled and they brought a coalition um, a army against them from Babylon toward what we call Israel. So they come. But here's the deal. This whole reason why this story is even in here and we're reading about it today is because Lot is a part of the equation. And Lot happens to be in the wrong place in the wrong time, as we'll see in the next verses. So in verses 5 through 12, for, for the sake of time, I'm just going to give us the cliff notes. There's, they have this war. This war breaks out. And uh, the, where Lot is dwelling in Sodom, they lose. And then they have this war. They, they lose the battle where he is in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says in verse 12 that they also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, uh, Abraham's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom. Now, now he, at first he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And now in verse 12, he's saying he's dwelling in Sodom and took his goods and they departed. So if we look at Lot's life, we see that he takes te steps downward. Step one, he looks up and he saw Sodom. Step two, he separates from Abram. Step three, he pinches his tit, what it said, toward Sodom. Then step forward, now all of a sudden he's in Sodom. He's in the mix of this wicked city that we read about before. He's living there. So we see that Lot takes several steps toward, tr downward toward trouble, and he's captured. He's taken. So now Abram has to get involved to save his nephew as we continue uh, in verses 13 and 15. And so the one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. And it's interesting. This is the first mention in the Bible of Abram being a Hebrew, the word Hebrew. For he dwelt in the terebinth tree of, of Mamre, and the Amorite, brother of Ishkal, and the brother of Enar, Ener, and they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So then we, in verse 15, we see the tactic that he uses. He says, he divided his forces against them at night. So he separated his men and, and attacked them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as, as Hobra, Hoba, uh, which is north of Damascus. So we see that Abram goes on pursuit here. He goes 150 miles north, where he, and he travels with 318 trained servants. And he has a strategy. He, he splits up his army and he attacks at night. 
And we see as we continue that that strategy works and that God gives them the victory. Because remember, he's going against four nations here, four different kings. And he has, what did it say, 318 men. And I don't know about you, but that kind of reminds me of what we read in Judges 7 when Gideon, God tells Gideon to make an army and he dwindles that army down to 300 men and he goes against an army of 135,000 men. They were highly outnumbered, just like Abram is highly outnumbered here, but God gives them the victory. And I believe it would be accurate to say that Abraham loved peace enough to fight for it. And sometimes... To accomplish peace, you have to fight for it. You know, there's many times, maybe, maybe you're not a physical fight that you're fighting, but maybe there's a fight between you and someone, and you're just like, you know what, I give up. I'm not going to fight for this relationship. But if you want peace with that person, sometimes it's worth fighting for. And that was, whole, that was Abram's whole position here. And now he deploys them in the, battle, in the battlefield, and we see that it works. As we continue, verses 16 through 17, it says, So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot. His brother Lot. And it's interesting he says his brother, by the way, because we know it's his nephew, but he, I think he's saying his brother because it's just like my brother uh, as a relative, as it would say. He brought his brother Lot and his goods as well as the w- women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of of Chaladolemir and the king who were and the kings that were with him. So Abram had military wisdom. He uses a clever tactic to attack at night, and he separates his army into two groups, and he succeeds in rescuing his nephew Lot and recovering all the plunder, all the all the goods that seized by the, the partnership of these four kings. And unfortunately for Lot, we know that Lot doesn't learn his lesson. He goes right back to Sodom, right back to that wicked city that he was in before. He didn't go back to the altar. He didn't go back like we see Abram going back. He goes back to Sodom. And we see eventually he loses everything when Sodom and Gomorrah is eventually judged and destroyed. So then we get to verse 18 and 20, and we get to see this interesting character named Melchizedek. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he he was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, speaking of Abram, gave him a tithe of all. So there's many things that that I want to talk about here. The first thing is this, this guy named Melchizedek. All right, there's many ideas of who this person is, but, but in reality, we have no idea where he came from. We have no idea how he came to be in Canaan and how he became a worshiper of the priests of the true God because he's living in a polytheistic culture where they worship a bunch of gods. All of a sudden, there's this, this guy who worships the one true God, the same God that Abraham's worship, worshiping. And we don't know how Abram actually came to know him either. We only know that he's there because it mentions him. But we do know that his name means king of righteousness. And he was the king of Salem. And Salem was the original Jerusalem. And Melchizedek also was a priest of God Most High. He was a worshiper and a priest of the true God, the same God that Abraham worshipped. And he's ruling over Jerusalem even in those the ancient times. That's very interesting. And one thing that makes Melchizedek unique is that he was a king and a priest. Now, this is interesting because history shows there's a danger in combining religious and civic authority. As a matter of fact, God actually forbade this, uh, the kings of Israel to be priests and the priests to be kings. And we see in 2 Chronicles that a king would try to be a priest and God strikes him with, with leprosy because of this. But Melchizedek is unique because he was the exception. He was a priest and a king of the, of, and the priest of God Most High. So what does he do? Melchizedek served Abraham bread and wine. And and as I I think about this, and I think perhaps he was serving in the manner of of knowing what was going to happen later on. As we take communion and remember what Christ did, he was looking forward to Jesus Christ, the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
Perhaps that was what he was doing. And Melchizedek, as priest, had, had two things. He blessed Abram and he blessed God. And though he seems like to be the, this uh, strange figure, he was in fact a very important person in the Old Testament. In Psalms 110, verse 4, says of Melchizedek, the, the priesthood of the Messiah is the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek opposed to the order of Aaron, which would be Moses' brother. And in Hebrews 7, verse 3, it describes Melchizedek as without father, without mother, without genealogy, neither beginning of days nor end of, li end of life, but made like the Son of God, remaining a priest continuously. Now, when you read that or hear that, what does that remind you of? It reminds you of Jesus. And because of this passage, many people believe that this was Jesus uh, appearing before his time in Bethlehem. It was a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus. But I will say this, the question can't be settled completely. Because I believe otherwise the identity of Melchizedek would have been agreed upon by biblical scholars, but it's not agreed upon as, as of today. But we can say at very least that he was a remarkable um, type or picture of Jesus Christ. And in verse 20, it says, He gave him a tithe of all. So Abram gave unto the Lord through Melchizedek a tithe of all. And this is referring to one-tenth of his assets, not his income, because his income essentially was his assets, right? And this is one of the places where the Bible gives us the idea of a tithe offering. See, Abram gave his tithe offering to the Lord through Melchizedek, and we, one way we give our tithe offering to the Lord is through the church, and we, that's where we get this idea, and we see that he gives them a tenth of all, all they have. That's where we get the 10% from. It's from this story right here. But if you look at their lives, it's almost as if Abram and Melchizedek worked to see who could bless each other more. Each one of them gave each other stuff out of their assets, out of their resources. Melchizedek blessed Abram out of his resources, and Abram blessed Melchizedek by giving them this tithe offering out of his resources. And this is a great attitude for us in a, in a community of believers. And in contrast to what we saw with Abram and Lot, where the world is looking at that and maybe thinking, you know, they're just like us. They're no different. And it's much more attractive to, have a, to be like Melchizedek and Abram. It's very much more attractive if you see uh, the believers taking care of each other, uh, making sure their needs are met. That's so attractive to an unbelieving world. It's like, oh my gosh, they're taking care of each other. There must be something to this. And it reminds me of also what we see in Acts 4, where the believers had everything in common, and they met all, the, all each other's needs. And that's the way our lives should reflect to a, an unbelieving world, where in contrast to Abram and Lot, they argued and fight, and the world looks at that, and they're like, you know what? That's, that's just like me. That's why we, we are to be separated and, and live our life like we see here at the end. So let's keep going, verses 21 and 24. And as we close up the chapter, it says, Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of the heavens and the earth, and I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say that I have made Abram rich. Now, it, it, so it must have been that, that Abram made an oath to the Lord, essentially saying, Lord, Lord, give me this battle and you will get all the glory. And he's, and he's thinking, if they give him money, if he gets all the, the plunder and stuff, well, they're gonna, people are going to say, well, they made me rich and that's why he did it. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted God to get the glory. And there's something else, maybe perhaps he remembered his time in Egypt and remembered taking the spoils from Egypt in chapter 12. And he remembers that uh, because the Pharaoh had given him all this stuff when he said that his wife was his sister. And he says, you know what, I don't want to repeat that. I don't want to do that again. 
But then he says in verse 24, except only that the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, that's Enor, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their, their portion. So we see Abram didn't impose his principles on his Amorite allies. He, he wanted them to get what was coming, what was, they were supposed to get according to the customs of the time. So as we close, I just want to conclude with, with three warnings that we see in this, these two chapters. Number one, be careful with your vision. Be careful what you look up and see. Because a lot, he saw the wor- what the world had to offer. And he wanted what the world had to offer. So as your, are your eyes on the worldly things or are they set on heavenly things? Are they set on that heavenly city that is, is prepared for us by God? So be careful with your vision and what you set your eyes on. Number two, be careful with your values. What are you valuing? The Bible says where a man's treasure is, there will be his heart also. See, Lot had a tent of altar. He, he looked up. He valued this great land, this well-watered land. And Abram, he, he valued God. He trusted God. He, he, he valued God in a way that he said, God, you know what? I'm going to let Abram, I'm going to let Lot choose, and I trust you. He valued God and the trust that he had in God. So be careful with your values. Number three, be careful with the choices that you make. Lot made a decision to go to Sodom, to live in Sodom. First he dwelt towards Sodom, and then all of a sudden we see that he's actually in Sodom. And maybe he thought that was best for his family. But we, we continue, as we continue through Genesis, the ironic thing is that Lot loses his family. He loses his family. He goes to Sodom and he's going to flee Sodom, but his wife is going to turn around and he's going to lose his wife and his family. And Abram made a choice based on God's promises. And he got a family bigger than what he can count. It, it says more than the number than the dust, more than the number in the stars. And remember, he was unable to have children. He was in his, his 70s or 80s, and he, and he couldn't have children, but God did it. See, our choices matter, trusting in the Lord. So could it be that today that you should choose to go back to Bethel, that you should choose to go back to the altar, to rededicate your heart to him and go back to the things that, that you did before when you had this closeness with the Lord? Maybe you've left. Maybe you've gone toward the, the Egypt in your life. Or maybe you've gone toward the plains of Jordan where, where you thought that you were going to be filled and nurtured, but you've come up empty. Maybe today is the day where the Lord will bring you back in alignment to himself. So as we close, remember, repent, and repeat. Go back to the Lord. Draw close to the Lord and he will draw close to you.